Good afternoon. Happy New Year and welcome to our webinar. I'm Paula Feldman, Director of Business Intelligence with PMMI. Today, we will hear from Jonathan Murphy, Research and Consulting Economist with ITR Economics. Jonathan will be covering the findings of PMMI's first quarter 2016 quarterly economic outlook report. Jonathan provides economic consulting services for small businesses, trade associations, and Fortune 500 companies across the spectrum of industries. That economic insight and forecasting experience plays a key role in ITR's economics 94.7 accuracy rating. Since 2011, when Jonathan started with ITR, he's helped domestic and global companies maximize profitability by applying business cycle analysts to strategic management decision making. Jonathan's research is on the cutting edge in business applications of leading indicator analysis and industrial forecasting. Jonathan graduated from Framingham State University with a BA in economics, and he specializes in international economics. Today, Jonathan will interpret the information included in the quarterly outlook and provide insight on how today's economy may be affecting your packaging and processing operations. If you have any questions during the webinar that you would like to ask Jonathan, please type your questions in the chat box. It's located on the right-hand corner of the screen. The presentation should last approximately 30 to 45 minutes, and at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to answer all your questions at that point. So now I'd like to welcome Jonathan and hand the webinar over to him. Thank you, Paula. Good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, as Paula said, I am John Murphy from ITR Economics, and this webinar today will be split into about three different uh, pieces. The first 15 minutes or so, we will be talking about ITR Economics' outlook for the overall economy, uh, specifically with the U.S. industrial production as our benchmark. Then we will look at the individual markets included in the PMMI report, and finally look at some of the international markets, uh, look at the international stage. That should leave us about uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, for question and answer, and I look forward to helping, helping all of you as we progress not only through this webinar, but also through 2016. Before we get into the meat of the webinar, I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about some of the terms and um, terms that you'll encounter as I go through this webinar and this report. Um, some of these may be familiar to you, especially as you have looked through the report in the past. At ITR Economics, our focus is primarily on what we call data trends and rates of change. Data trends are um, just monthly moving totals or averages as necessary. We focus primarily on what we call the 12-month moving total or 12 MMT. The 12-month moving total is annual activity, annual sales, annual production, things like that. That gives us the long-term outlook, the long-term uh, trend that helps smooth out any seasonal volatility, helps smooth out any one-month anomalies that might occur and gives us the overall picture. Uh, to a lesser extent, we use a three-month moving total or average. That is for um, seasonality, and it helps us look at how seasonal trends compare. The three-month moving total um, also helps give us an idea on what's going on with the 12-month moving total. If a seasonal trend is more severe than usual, then we um, can begin to get an idea of what will happen with the 12-month moving total as we progress. And a 12-month moving total, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's just the most recent 12 months added together, and it gives us um, this, o this overall outlook. We also focus on rates of change. Rates of change are just growth rates. The two primary ones that you'll hear me talk about in this webinar and that you'll see in your report are the 12-12 rate of change. That looks like a fraction when we write it out, 12 divided by 12. That is the growth rate of your 12-month moving total. It's comparing the 12-month moving total in the current month and its rate of growth from the same month uh, last year. 
So for example, if a 12-month moving total is, say, 4%, that means the 12 um, the 12 month moving total is 4% higher in the current month than it was this time last year. And when we talk about um when we talk about uh, annual uh rates of change, annual growth, that's what we're referring to, the 12 12 rate of change. The 3 12 rate of change is the same mathematics, but you're comparing the current 3 month moving total to the same period um last year. This we'll often refer to as quarterly growth rate or the 312 rate of change. They're one and the same. What we do then to help um, visualize everything is we chart the 1212 rate of change as a time series, as a line graph. And that allows us to see what the direction of the 1212, uh, where it's going. What That is important because it gives us where we are in the phase of the business cycle, uh, where your individual business is, where your company is, uh, where your industry is in the business cycle is important because you're going to want to do different actions in different um, different phases. When the 12-12 is negative, but it's rising on the chart, that's what we call phase A recovery. That is a period your sales or your industry Annual, on an annual basis, still below the year-ago level, but the rate of decline is either slowing or things are starting to get better but not quite above year-ago levels yet. Once the 12-12 rate of change surpre- surpasses and moves into positive territory and it is rising, uh, on the chart in front of us, it's, that's the green part, it's phase B, uh, growth of the business cycle. This is the best phase of the business cycle. It's when your activity is increasing the fastest, you're feeling busy, and everybody's happy. The following phase, so the 12-12 rate of change is still positive, but the 12-12 is increasingly getting smaller. That's what we call phase C, slower growth of the business cycle. It's the orange section on the chart in the slide in front of you. Slower growth, the way to think about this phase is you're driving in your car on the highway and you take your foot off the gas pedal. You're still moving forward, but moving forward at a slower pace. Phase C is still a growth period, but the growth is slowing its rate of rise. Finally, the red phase down here is phase D, recession. Your 12-12 is negative, meaning your annual sales are contracting compared to the same time last year, and that rate of decline is increasing. Um, As we progress through the different phases, different management objectives um, need to be applied. When you're in phase D, for example, you wouldn't want to necessarily be hiring right at that time. That's just obvious, but that is why we look at the phases of the business cycle and in the reports, why we report the phases to you. So let's take a look at our overall overall U.S. economic forecast. U.S. total industrial production is our benchmark for the overall economy. Last month, in December, ITR Economics, we revised our forecast. Um, it was a minor change, but it was necessary. Our previous forecast we had established in with uh, data through July 2014. And actually through December, that data came smack in line with our forecast. However, the leading indicators, um, Purchasing Managers Index, U.S. leading indicator, ITR leading indicator, they were all suggesting that the U.S. economy was still going to grow, but that period of slower growth would persist longer into 2016 than we originally forecast. We were anticipating a 12-12 low for U.S. industrial production in early 2016, and then we would see accelerating growth through the end of the year. However, our new forecast is to see slower growth through the first half of 2016, but then accelerating growth in the second half of the year and into early 2017. The lighter blue lines, lighter blue dots, I should say, on this chart are our old forecast that you have seen in most of your PMMI reports over the past year. 
The orange is the new forecast that you will see in the upcoming report next month. You can see that there is simul similarity between the two because we are still forecasting growth over the next several years through 2018. The pace is a little bit more moderate, uh, and where we were originally forecasting to see stronger growth in the second half of 2016, it's now more. <coughs> excuse me. It's now more towards. Um, late 2016, early 2017, that we will be seeing the strongest growth in U.S. industrial production. Additionally, what I want to point out with this forecast is we are calling for the next macroeconomic U.S. recession to occur in 2019. This is the slow, down, uh, downward slope that you see in 2019. Now, this is still uh, many years out, but it is something to keep in, in mind. However, when you're planning this year, when you're conducting your planning sessions, plan on about three years of growth for your, for your company. We're looking at positivity in 2016 straight on through 2018. <clears throat> Another one of our major macroeconomic indicators that we had to reforecast was non-defense capital goods new orders. This does play into many of your forecasts as well, considering um, this is capital equipment. Non-defense capital goods new orders is currently in phase D recession right now. This is the 12-12 rate of change plotted, and you can see it is below the zero line. And Fong. So that is our phase D. The green dots were our previous forecast, and the blue dotted lines are the is our uh, new forecast, the bounds of our new forecast. With non-defense capital goods, we were expecting more of a V-shaped recovery, as you can see in the green dots. We've basically elongated that. It's more of a U-shaped recovery now. But 2016 is still going to be a better year for non-defense capital goods new orders than it was last year, and that's definitely positive for PMMI members. Now, the reason for this forecast change primarily comes from mining. Uh, the mining sector, which includes uh, oil and gas, has really uh, been a drag on the U.S. economy in 2015. We've seen falling commodity prices, uh, oil prices, metal prices, uh, things like that. And a lot of miners and drillers have cut back on their equipment. And that's a lot of the reason why uh, we've seen this decline in non-defense capital goods new orders. However, some of our leading indicators are suggesting that this phase A recovery trend is approaching. <clears throat> Even though we do have recovery coming, we expect it will be more modest, as you can see, primarily because we're not expecting um, commodity prices to rise considerably in 2016 um, compared to our previous forecast when we were expecting this more V-shape. We do expect some price rise, um, but it will be uh, much more modest, um, more moderate than we had previously anticipated. <clears throat> Uh, Non-defense capital goods, the 12-month moving total. Um, you can see here the green dots, again, the previous forecast. The blue dots are the more recent one. You can see that it is a longer, uh, more slow um, recovery than we had, were previously forecasting, more of a U-shape rather than a V-shape in non-defense capital goods. So these two, um, these two point to a relatively soft... Um, industrial side of the economy right now. Um, but overall, I want to drive home the point that our, our expectations for 2016, 2017, 2018 haven't changed a whole lot. The year-end values have, but we are expecting 2016 to be a better year than 2015. That's consistent with our forecast from um, July 2014. We expect 2017 will be an even better year, and even 2018 uh, will be a stronger year. Um, it's towards 2019 before we see our next macroeconomic U.S. recession. So we've seen softness in 
mining um, and mining and the utility side of the sect of the uh, economy. Manufacturing is still growing, uh, although it is in phase C. The manufacturing side it has grown um, uh, through 2015. But there are other headlines that don't necessarily show up in that U.S. industrial production number immediately that I want to tell and why we're not expecting a recession right now in the U.S. economy. First off, retail sales, excluding fuel sales, are up almost 5%, up 4.8%. Um, the overall, the headline retail sales number that the news uh, like to report on, they include fuel prices. They include fuel sales. Well, gasoline prices have fallen considerably over the past year, um, and that has dragged down in nominal terms, in dollar terms, retail sales overall. When we take out that, when we adjust for the prices, we're looking at almost 5% growth. The U.S. consumer is very strong right now. What's driving that growth is real wages are rising. By real wages, I mean wages adjusted for inflation. This is a double-edged sword. Uh, for retailers, for um, consumers, it's a positive thing. Um, even if a person, um, even if a person's paycheck hasn't changed a whole lot, prices aren't eating away at that, and they have more money, more discretionary income in their pockets that they are spending and saving to some extent. The other side of that is when you are making your hiring decisions in 2016 and probably also 2017 you're going to be paying your workers a higher raise, a higher wage, um, and you might not be able to increase your prices to help compensate for that. So it is one thing to keep in mind as uh, you're moving forward in 2016. Are there any ways that you can increase efficiency with your current labor force? Uh, any ways that you can um, help promote automation? This can also help work um, for your sales as um, manufacturers rely more on automation to help offset some of these real wages. The construction side of the economy is also very positive right now. Residential housing starts are up 10.9% through November, and non-residential construction is up 9%. So we're seeing some very positive momentum right now in the overall U.S. economy. That's part of the reason why U.S. industrial production has not fallen into a recession right now and why we don't expect it. Um, housing starts acts as a leading indicator for the U.S. economy, as does retail sales. So the fact that these numbers are up 10.9% and 4.8% respectively suggests that we will start to see some of that accelerating growth that we're forecasting for U.S. industrial production in the second half of this year. So this was the overall picture of the economy. But let's take a look at some of the specific markets that are included in your report. <clears throat> First off, we have pharmaceutical and medical device production. Overall in this industry, we're looking at steady growth through 2017. 4.6% growth in 2016, 3.5% uh, growth in 2017. Uh, the industry is in phase C, decelerating growth, so that it is growth, but it's growing at a slower rate. Uh, where there are opportunities in this market, two main areas. One in the electromedical side, so that's the wearable tech, that's the heart monitors, the, um, um, the, the electrical side, the electronic gadget side of medical devices. That's growing very, uh, very strongly right now. On the pharmaceutical side, we're also seeing uh, some good growth coming from um, drugs and, um, and uh, um, medicine production. The FDA in 2015 has um, been improving drugs at a rate not seen since, uh, since the mid-90s. Uh, they've approved more drugs um, last year than they have in almost 20 years. As these are now coming towards the market and will likely see um, increased demand, um, we suspect that the pharmaceutical side will be picking up as well. And these will contribute to the accelerating growth that we're forecasting for this series, beginning actually rather imminently, beginning um, 
we expect a low to form this quarter, and then next quarter you should start to see some accelerating growth in activity for your um, for those of you dealing with this particular market. <clears throat> Another positive market right now is food and food preparation. Unlike the overall economy, which is in phase C, food and food prep is in phase B, accelerating growth of the business cycle right now. However, growth is not uniform throughout this industry. We are seeing um, particularly very strong growth in animal food production, and that is both... um, food for cats and dogs and domestic animals, but as well as um, food for livestock. We're seeing strong growth in that area. Uh, Meat production has uh, rebounded and is doing nicely. But there's um, negativity developing in several other industry uh, segments. Dairy production has uh, fallen. Uh, We're starting to see weakness in um, sugar and candy confections, um, the sweet side of business. Um, We're also seeing some decline in uh, preserved food um, production. So that is something to keep in mind. And this seems to be a general trend in the overall economy. One thing that we'll talk about in a couple of slides is a decline in soda production. There is a move in the U.S. economy right now moving away from um, processed foods, from sweet foods, from, um, I guess generally speaking, the, the sin foods, um, to use a colloquial term, and more towards healthy alternatives, um, organics to some extent, and um, fresh fr- fresh foods. Um, so even though food products overall is rising and will continue to grow through 2017, um, some of the less healthy stuff you would likely see, less demand um from as we progress over the next couple of years. Personal care products, um, as this is a consumer-related industry, um, this is growing right now, uh, up uh, 5.6% over the past year. And generally, we're going to see growth in personal care products over the next couple of years. Uh, With real wages rising, with employment um, boosting, Uh, This highly consumer-based industry um, will continue to expand and should be a growth area for PMMI members, um, not only in the near term, not only this year, but even into 2017 and 2018. Um, I would expect that we would not see any um, overt decline in this particular industry until we move closer to the um, next recession in 2019. <clears throat> beverages, coffee, and tea production. This forecast we are currently reviewing, and you will likely see an updated version um, in the next PMMI report, which is due next month. But this is uh, a positive industry right now. Its um, growth is above year-ago levels, right now at 0.2%. Um, but we're seeing positivity in a lot of different segments. Uh, Coffee and tea production in particular is growing well. Um, Anything related to liquor production, wine, um, hard liquor, distilleries, we're seeing increase in production there. Even breweries, beer breweries, uh, which have uh, recently shown some weakness, we're starting to see some recovery trend in brewery production. Um, I know I have mentioned this in the past, but I think it's worth mentioning again. With breweries, we're seeing a lot of strong growth out of the microbrew market. Um, As a matter of fact, a new report released by the Brewers Association of America reports that approximately one new microbrewery opens up a day in America. So that's a strong market. It won't be as reliable as, say, sales to Budweiser or sales to Coors Miller, um, any of the big ones. But it is a growing market um, that um, I think has some potential for PMMI members if you are willing to chase um, small clients. Um, As I talked about earlier, uh, we have some weakness coming from soda production. 
any of the sugary drink productions actually. Um, that is a drag. It's right now. It's the only segment of beverage and coffee and tea production that is currently in phase D. Um, so sodas, the unhealthy beverages, are showing some sign of weakness, but liquor, um, coffee, breweries, um, juices, those are showing more potential right now in um, beverage and coffee production in 2016. <clears throat> Chemicals and cleaning products. This is another area that is currently outperforming our forecast, and you will likely see another. Um, you'll likely see a, a um, up, um, um, upgrade to this forecast in the next report. Generally speaking, this is the U.S. is right now a very positive market for chemicals and cleaning products production. We have very low energy costs compared to the rest of the world. We've seen some chemical. Um, factories moving in from Europe, from um, China into the United States to open up new plants. Um, very closely tied to the consumer market as well, which is likely driving some of this positivity. So overall, the chemical cleaning products market, very positive right now. And we suspect that trend will continue through um, 2017 and into 2018 as well. Positive growth um, for this market. One other thing to keep in mind is we have seen um, building construction, chemical plant construction, uh, almost double in the past year. It's grown 99.7% in 2015 compared to 2014. That's a lot of new buildings that are coming online, and a lot of new buildings that will be needing machinery to, um, to fill them. So I think there will be a demand for PMMI members' um, sales as we go through 2016 coming from that construction alone. Last major PMMI specific market is durables, hard goods, and components. Very consumer related. This market has been generally growing. We've seen some nice steady growth since the end of the 2008 recession. That is a trend we expect will continue through 2016-2017. Um, we're going to see some accelerating growth in the second half of this year um, and then some slowing growth as we transverse through 2017. But overall, durables and hard goods um, will be seeing growth, especially anything that's tied to home um, home improvement or home construction. So we talked about at the beginning, we've seen um, housing starts rising, wholesale trade of furniture and furniture retail sales are growing as well. People are building homes, they're renovating their homes, and they're buying new um, furniture, new hard goods and um, durables to fill up their homes, to uh, improve their cars, to improve their, to improve their lives. So this is a, a positive market, benefiting from the consumer sales, benefiting from those re, uh, rising real wages that we expect will continue um, over the next three years. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So we talked a lot about the U.S. Let's take a look at the international picture and what's going on globally. Um, before I go into some of the individual countries, individual regions, let's talk the big picture. The good news is most of the world is doing well right now. I'm going to point out um, some key areas, specifically Latin America, that um, is not doing not doing well right now, but overall, most of the world is looking pretty good. Um, and that stands to benefit U.S. exporters um, and even the U.S. Um, importers to some extent because we expect uh, as the global economy slowly improves, the U.S. dollar, which has been relatively strong over the past year, we expect that will weaken a little bit as we progress um, through 2016, not Significantly, but we will see some weakening, and that will reduce um, that will reduce the cost advantage that importers have had for, um, uh, or I should say that imported machinery, imported goods, have had against domestically produced. So if you're competing against 
um, clients uh, against um, competitors who use foreign-made components, and they've been able to out, uh, underprice you, undercut your prices. We expect that some of that advantage will be evaporating in 2016. So let's take a look at Canada first, our neighbor to the north. The Canadian industrial production is technically in phase D recession right now. Um, we've seen we've seen the um, uh, industry co um, contract over the past year, but that's primarily because of oil prices. I want to point out that unlike U.S. industrial production and most of the other production um, series that are measured in an index. Canada industrial production is measured in Canadian dollars. And the falling value of oil has reduced um, the prices received um, and has reduced that in turn Canada industrial production's Canadian dollar value. Other segments, the retail side, the construction side of Canada are improving right now. Um, so there is still growth in Canada outside of the oil sectors outside of um, Alberta and the, uh, the tar sands area. Looking at North America as a whole, we can see that Canada is kind of the outlier here. The U.S. is growing, Mexico is growing. Um, granted, at fairly modest paces, 1.9% of the U.S., 1.4% Mexico. But North America as a whole is still um, the major growth in engine outside of the Canadian oil industry. Looking to Latin America, South America, this is what I hinted at a couple of minutes ago. Latin America right now is still very negative. We've seen uh, it's in phase D recession. Um, Brazil is the main driver of weakness in the region, although there are other other um, uh, countries that are declining, Brazil being the largest economy, they are the one driving most of this decline. Uh, some of it is commodity-based. A lot of these economies are based off of mining, off of ethanol, off of oil. And with the fall in commodity prices globally, um, they've cut back, they've had to cut back on some of their production. Especially some of the Pacific countries um, that are tied with trade to China. Uh, as China's economy has slowed over the last year, um, China has been cutting back on the metals that they've purchased, the metals that they've consumed. And some of the Latin America countries that are heavily tied in trade with China um, have really started to feel some of that pinch. Although we do expect Latin America to shift into an overall Phase A recovery trend, it's going to be very mild, and 2016 will still end 20, uh, will still end below the 2015 level. 2017 will be a growth year, but very modest, just 0.4%. Uh, Latin America, um, if you are willing to um, sit on investments, now is a good time to purchase competitors in Latin America or um, purchase property, purchase um, any kind of resources that you need down in Latin America if you're willing to sit on them. Um, but as far as active selling goes, it'll be a difficult environment um, through uh, at least 2017. As I said at the beginning, Brazil is the main driver of decline in the market. Peru, Chile, Argentina are also all contracting. Ecuador and Colombia we're seeing some mild improvements. So there are opportunities in South America, but overall in the largest economies, um, in the commodity, large economy, um, commodity-based economies, um, it's a, be a difficult environment for active selling. Europe, however, Europe is improving. Um, we have actually recently revised, upward revised our forecast for Europe industrial production. It is in phase B, accelerating growth, growing a nice 1.5% um, over where it was last year. We expect this growth will persist through 2016 and 2017 um, and might even approach the um, pre-recession peak by the time we end 2017. Europe has benefited through trade with the United States, um, being 
as we were essentially the only one of the fastest growing economies in the world um, in 2015, and a relatively weak euro has made some has made uh, exports from Europe into the United States very profitable. Um, the automobile industry, in particular, is driving growth in Europe, um, as well as a generally improving consumer market. And also, the growth is fairly widespread throughout Europe. Um, the problem areas of, are, of course, U- uh, Ukraine with uh, their um, civil war, uh, Greece, still an area, Switzerland, Netherlands, Belgium. So a couple of areas that are contracting, but the major economies, UK, Germany, France, um, Poland in the east, uh, Turkey, Spain, they're they're all growing and they're looking um, pretty positive right now. Ireland uh, growing strongly as well. So overall, there is growth in Europe, um, which is a nice um, a nice pace and will help. That will help solve some of that uh, current the currency issues that I mentioned a little um, a little bit ago. <coughs> Excuse me. final region that we're looking at is Southeast Asia. Um, although this in, this region does not specifically include China, there is a lot of um, trade with Southeast Asia and China. So a lot of the weakness that we're seeing right now in Southeast Asia, you can see just 4% growth, uh, 0.4% growth, excuse me, has been because there's been less demand, less trade with China. The good news for this region, they also do a lot of business with the United States. Um, Automobile parts, electronics, things like that come from Southeast Asia. And we expect as the U.S. economy accelerates in 2016, and to a lesser extent, China, so will Southeast Asia. We're also starting to see some improvement coming out of Japan. Um, According to U.S. Industrial Production, Japan has been in a recession through most of 2015. They have only recently shifted into phase A recovery. And growing Japan, growing the United States, and um, uh, an accelerating, modestly accelerating, I should say, modestly accelerating China um, in 2016 will help spur some of this growth in the region. Um, Taking a wider look at Asia, China talked about at 6.3%. It's a very slow growth rate um, for what they have had in the past. Um, China is has in the past been growing at double digit rates. This is the slowest since um, the depths of the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. But generally speaking, we're seeing some positivity throughout the region. Um, Singapore is a is contracting though at minus 4.4%. Taiwan, Thailand, South Korea is falling as I talked a little bit about Japan. But some of the other areas are seeing some positivity right now. So Southeast Asia, um, slow in the near term, but then accelerating growth in the second half of 2016 and growth in 2017 as well. And so at this time, I would like to open it up to questions. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, and um, I would like to make sure that I have plenty of time to answer the questions you have. Thanks so much, John. Um, it was a great, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a great report that you, you put out and great information that you shared with us. Um, Is it possible, can you share more detail on the exchange rate U.S. versus major currencies? Um, Well, that is a little bit more detail than I um, have prepared. Um, As far as major currencies like the euro, um, the U.S. exchange rate, well, the U.S. right now, The U.S. dollar is very strong right now compared to most currencies. I don't think that's news to anybody. Um, Couple, and a lot of that has been been because the global economy has been very soft right now. Um, As a lot of these regions that we talked about improve next year, 
um, expect the U.S. dollar will lose some of its value, not all of it. We're not talking, you know, a huge devaluation in 2016, um, but start to see some weakening of the U.S. dollar, particularly against the euro, the Canadian dollar, um, the Australian dollar, um, Japanese yen to a, uh, some extent. However, uh, the Brazilian real, some of the South American economy, um, South American co uh, currencies, we're not likely to see some major devaluation um, just because, as we talked about, there's weakness um, in South America that we're not expecting to dissipate um, anytime soon. Super, thank you. Um, how concerned should we be about rising interest rates in 2016? Well, so the Federal Reserve, they did raise their interest rates a little bit at the end of the year, up just a quarter of a percent. We expect interest rates will be rising very modestly in 2016, not 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 percent. Um, the economic growth isn't there for that kind of um, rise. But we are expecting some modest interest rate rise in 2016. Um, that can actually be a good thing as it might spur some um, investors, some um, people who have been looking to borrow but really, haven't been, really have been putting it off hesitating because interest rates have been so low, you know, where uh, this nudge might um, be enough like, hey, i got to borrow now because interest rates are going up. So we, might, we are expecting actually to see a little tick up in uh, commercial and industrial credit and um, – this is actually driving some of our expectation for accelerating growth in non-defense capital goods new orders in the late, latter half of this year. We did take into account the interest rate um, rise when we did our new forecast, and you can see we're not expecting it to really derail our forecast. Um, so be aware of the interest rate rise, but don't expect such a small, modest change to put the uh, put screeching brakes on the economy. Okay. Um, another question we have is, and bear with me one minute while I go back to it. Uh, why do you see a U.S. dollar weakening in 2016? <clears throat> so primarily it's um, primarily it's growing uh growing economic activity in the rest of the world. For the last, um, I'm going to say 12 to 18 months, the U.S., even though we've been growing slow, has been pretty much the economy in the world. Uh, to use one of my favorite metaphors, we're the least ugly dog in the pageant. Um, and that has brought a lot of money to the United States, um, which in turn, <coughs> excuse me, which in turn has um, strengthened our currency versus um, some of the others. With the growth that we're looking at in Europe, with the uh, growth looking at um, in South, um, uh, I almost said South America, but that's not right, Australia, um, Japan we're expecting to be in recovery. We're expecting to see some movement in China uh, in the latter half of this year. These will help... Um, combat a little of the rise in the U.S. dollar that we've seen and help help um, devalue it a little bit. Again, we're not talking a massive revision or massive um, devaluation in the dollar, but um, we're forecasting that its strength, its current strength, will likely be weakened a little bit in 2016. Very good. Um, any greater detail on the recession in 2019? Um, how deep might it be? How long might it go? So the recession in 2019, uh, 2019 um, it will be about it will be about as deep as the recession in the early 1990s. We're not talking for we're not calling for another 2008. Um, it will only be in 2019 as well. So a relatively mild, relatively short um, recession. At this point, we don't have a lot of 
uh, physical um, indicators to, to point at, it's still at this point a little bit theoretical. Um, our We've been forecasting and analyzing U.S. economic trends. Um, well, our founder was doing it during the Great Depression. Um, then he founded the company in 1946. So we've been looking at these for years, and we found that a recession occurs approximately every 10 years or so, give or take. Um, so 2019 would be, um, at this point, when we're expecting the next um, recession because it has been about 10 years since um, the 2008 recession. Um, as we progress through this year, we'll start to some of our longest term indicators, like um, um, corporate bond prices, we'll, that, they'll start to give us an idea what's going on um, in 2018, 2019. So stay tuned. Over the next year, we'll, be, we'll start to get more and more information, and especially as we move through 2017. Um, but at this point, in regards to 2019, um, I don't have anything that I can point to hard and fast and say, you know, this is will be what causes it. Um, and I, wa I wanted to mention it to keep in the back of your minds, but for the next um, three years, 16, 17, and 18, look at growth, look at expansion, look at improving your business. So when the next recession does come, um, whether it be in 2019 or 2020, um, your, position, your business will be in a better position. And even when the recession comes, even if your sales fall, you'll still be in a better place um, at that point than you are right now. Great. Thank you so much, John. And we have one final question that is top of mind of everybody because it seems to be a, a hot topic right now. We all know why. Uh, will the presidential election affect the forecast? What What can you glean on this topic? That's an excellent question. And it's one thing that we've looked at in the past. And we, in our research, we found that presidential elections don't have huge impacts on the economy with rare exceptions. Um, obviously, obviously, in the 1930s with the uh, New Deal legislation, when you have something massive like that that comes along, um, that will have an effect. But the presidential election itself, um, not, not so much. And even should it, we, won't, we really won't start to see the effects until late 2018 um, anyway. Um, and let me just kind of spell that out. So we have an election November 2016. Whoever gets elected and the new Congress, they don't get sworn in until January of 2017. Even if they pass a brand new budget on day one of the new, um, new Congress, that won't go into effect um, for another year until um, September 2017. Um, the new fiscal year in the government. So we really won't start to see the, the effects into 2018. That said, we do monitor. We do look at um, when legislation is passed, when budgets are passed. We do look at that. Um, but as of the election itself, uh, we do not expect that it will derail um, our forecast as it is right now. Great information. Thanks again, John. Um, all of your insight on the economic situation and its effect on the members and their competitive position they might have has been fantastic. I want to thank you for that. On behalf of PMMI, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. Um, just as a note, you will receive an email to complete the evaluation on today's webinar, or it will pop up when I close the webinar out. Please let us know how we're doing. Uh, please let us know what topics you might like to see other webinars on besides a quarterly economic. And this webinar will be posted on PMMI.org no later than Monday. And thank you once again, John, and everyone in attendance. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too. Thanks again.